Right, gonna have to depend on the phone for the first bit. Right then, law. There you go. <laughs> Many thanks to Edwin Starr there. Right, law, what is it good for? Let's have a look, shall we? Nothing, unless you use it correctly. Nothing at all. Um, that 40 plus down there doesn't uh, correspond to my age or the amount of complaints I've had for social media use in my career over the years. Um, one of my ex-bosses is over there, probably having a flashback at the moment. He's going <laughs> to need therapy after this. Um, right, it actually reflects the amount of campaigns that I've been involved in that uh, have tried to deter people from using mobile phones. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of campaigns. I'm not a big fan of peak and trough awareness or enforcement. Uh, it doesn't change wholesale behaviour. And I think nearly all of those campaigns I've been involved with have pretty much been a waste of time with regards to changing wholesale behaviour, apart from one, which was mine, which I did. <laughs> but I may be a bit, uh, a bit prejudiced with regards to that. Um, we need effective, efficient enforcement, and we need to keep it constant. What are we doing about it? Absolutely nothing, as Edwin said in that brilliant song. Right. We've got an increase in offences straight off. That's self-admitted offences. The RIC figures show a rise in offences, you can see there, 29 up from 23%. Um, more worryingly, we have Generation Z, 18 to 24, and for the first time ever, we're going to have a generation of people and drivers that have a 100% saturation of smartphone use. Every single one of them uses a smartphone, and they don't just use a smartphone, they're addicted to smartphones. It's an illness. And I say that as somebody who's addicted to their own phone, but uh, obviously I don't use it when I'm driving because of what I do for a living. But they don't, they view it completely different. Imagine if you had a generation coming into driving that were addicted to something else with the same amount of cognitive in distraction involved, i.e. drugs or alcohol because that's the amount of cognitive distraction that we're looking at when they use their mobile phone. So the challenge that we face around mobile phone use and the demand it causes um, is going to increase. Um, that 21% offence rate and 32% call offending responds to um, a little bit of work that me and a few friends did. Um, I have a working group um, that consists of a range of people uh, including some specialist traffic barristers, a um, couple of people who work for the CPS, a judge, um, a couple of psychologists and marketing manager, um, all who are interested in road-based offending. And uh, when I was talking about doing this presentation, I said, well, let's go out and see how bad it is. Um, and that 21% offence rate relates to 21% um, of vehicles that passed us in a certain time frame, which was about three quarters of an hour we did it for, they were offending. So 21% of the vehicles that passed us. 32% um, of the offences were call offending. Uh, and that Yankee Kilo just basically break, it was on the Staffordshire area, uh, um, automatic traffic signals with a pedestrian crossing involved as well. So probably the place where they should not be using their phone and paying attention. Um, there is a big difference between areas when we did some offence counting uh, where you have a more prolific enforcement rate. So if you go to the West Mids into a city centre location, you hardly get any call offending, so you don't see anybody with a phone to their ears at all, in comparison to Staffordshire, which has a very low enforcement rate. So people are more confident to use their phones in Staffordshire, it seems, in a visible fashion, um, rather than in the West Midlands. And we'll come on to that later, why that is. Um, just to further emphasise the problem, uh, journey here today, um, I had a lift to the train station this morning, um, which was 1.2 miles, in which I saw three offences. Um, then I had 50 minutes of calm when I was on the train, where I didn't get wound up at all. And then I had a taxi from the train station to here, which was five miles, um, I saw 18 offences, which included my own driver. Um, <laughs> which I did manage to sit there and shut up in the back of the taxi and not say a word, which is most unlike me, really. So what do we have? We have everything but nothing. We have everything we need, basically. Legislation, as we've seen from the previous um, 
presentation is now, as an enforcer, as a police officer, gives me everything I need to, con like, to deal with, handheld mobile phone use. Um, the sort of position we had with Barreto is now gone. Um, and I have a very usable piece of legislation which I can use in a variety of ways as long as I keep it well evidenced again and with the proliferation of cameras and the quality of HD cameras is very easy to do. Awareness, we have pretty much saturated awareness, although a lot of people will say they don't know what is an offence and what isn't an offence. Um, nearly everybody who drives knows that they can't touch that phone while driving and they know what a driving situation it is now. Um, um, social media is saturated with videos of people using mobile phones. People, people like cycling Mikey and people like that. Everybody knows what they can be done for, even if they're sitting in traffic. So awareness isn't a problem anymore. Enforcement, we have the ultimate enforcement tool in third party reporting. It is the golden chalice of enforcement as far as offending goes and changing wholesale behavior. That whole threat of being cut, caught any time any place, anywhere, what I always refer to as the martini effect, just like the old advert, for those who are old enough. Um, it's just brilliant. Um, never before, with anything else, have you had that, regards words offending, that whole chance of being caught all the time. Public support, we have nearly much, you know, apart from the people that actually do offend, um, we have pretty much wholesale public support. They know how dangerous it is. You get the cases that pop up on the front of the papers. You get the ones that are in the news every so often, and they know how dangerous it is to use your phone. And they know why as well, because everybody who's got a phone has those instances where they do get distracted even when they're not phone, when they're not driving. And the other thing is we have a driver in record demand. Um, the consequences of any driving offence uh, usually um, can be RTCs, and we're now at the point where RTCs cost us in excess of £40 billion pounds a year. Um, it is absolutely devastating for the country and the economy. So we have a demand that means, you know, we really need to do something about this. So we've got everything that we need, really. But what to do about it all? So we've got everything we need. We've got the situation, we've got the legislation, we've got the reason, we've got the enforcement tools. And we're basically on the starting blocks, just like it says shows there, really. Um, but what do we do about it all? At the moment, we are not effective. And I'll say that as, a, as somebody who's been doing this for years, we're not effective. Um, we're not effective because what we need to do is not just catch people, we need to change wholesale behavior. Um, we've all been guilty, practitioners like myself, of token gestures and virtue signaling, pretty much all the time. Um, we don't give a lot of thought about what we're trying to achieve and we're probably at the point now where we're starting to regress and we're seeing offending going up, as we've seen by the RIC figures. Um, we should be, this year, due to the cost of living crisis, seeing a dip in KSIs overall, because it's what traditionally happens when there's a cost of living crisis. People drive slower, people drive less because they can't afford to drive, and we should be seeing a dip in KSIs overall. Um, with a slight rise in vulnerable road users, KSIs, because people are forced into active travel because they can't afford to drive. Um, at the moment, it's not looking like that's gonna happen. Um, and we need to look at the reasons why we're not achieving that and why we previously, before the cost of living crisis, why we've been constantly plateauing regards our ability to change behavior and reduce offenses. And this is the reason why. The most dangerous phase in our language is we've always done it this way, a rear admiral race hopper. Um, and there's never a truer phrase when it comes to policing. Um, we love doing things the same way and we're doing the same things now that we were doing not long after 2003 when the mobile phone um, law came in. Um, and uh, that's the biggest problem we've got. And what we need to do is just change the way we think about it and the way we go about things. The first thing we need to do is look at standardization. Um, I can cycle around six counties where I live in about the space of an hour. I can see a mobile phone offence in each, I can record it and I can submit it via third party reporting and I will get six different results. Six completely different results, whether that's the disposal, whether it's the actual um, prosecution of the offence in the first place. Um, 
ranging from somebody could go to court and end up being disqualified for it, depending on their point situation, to somebody getting a warning letter, or some forces, due to demand, will just have to ignore it. You can't have that. You, you cannot deal with offences that way. It's not fair on the person reporting it, and it's not fair on the offenders either. Um, I'll come on to taxi drivers down in London shortly. Um, but um, again, it's something that probably wouldn't happen anywhere else in policing. And given the consequences that we talked about, that £40 billion a year cost of RTCs, um, it's something that we really need to look at. And that standardisation, um, unless it happens, will take away, um, if we don't do the standardisation, it will take away uh, and the attention that we need um, to put a perspective on the problem, as far as the, the public goes, where they view it in the same way as drink driving. Um, targets, and by targets, I don't mean targets in form of prosecution, but really a target in form of omitted offences. Again, a culture change, a behaviour change. So that RAC um, polling that you see, that's what we need to be changing. We want more and more people saying, no, I never use my phone, and actually mean it. And when they do the RAC sort of um, surveys, you do get quite a true and honest, you know, sort of um, answers to the questions, because they know there's no consequences to them, they're anonymous. So that's the sort of targets we need to look at. You're never going to enforce your way out of this problem. Um, you could give out, you know, you could give out thousands and thousands of more tickets a week, but it's wholesale behaviour you need to be looking at. And the way to do that is basically we move on to Cummings. And by Cummings, I mean Dominic Cummings. Um, I'm a big fan of Dominic Cummings, not the person, but the way he works. And I find him absolutely fascinating how he can make people identify or be worried of a problem group and change their behaviour. If you look what he's done in regards to elections and change the way people have voted and make them be fearful of something that doesn't really exist, it's something that we've really got to copy and use. I mean, apart from the fact he sat in the Rose Garden and admitted to dangerous driving on TV and nobody even batted an eyelid about it, uh, which is just absolutely shocking and then I'm supported by the Cabinet and the Prime Minister. Um, but that probably says more about our attitudes towards roads offending than anything else. Um, but that's the way we've got to do We've got to use his techniques. Um, identify people who are distracted through mobile phone use as a problem group. Label them as a problem group. Identify the offenders as part of the mobile problem group. And then peer pressure will take care of everything else. Nobody likes to be part of a problem group. If you, look, if you label an offender part of a problem, and then put them in the public domain, they will quickly disassociate themselves, either through changing their behaviour or modifying their behaviour to the point where it becomes negligible so they don't be associated with that part of the problem group. Um, if you look at parking outside of the schools, it's the classic example. Um, if you ever have a parking problem outside of school, um, just basically let the group of parents and guardians outside become aware of it, and through basically name and shame in the local Facebook group, you will change every like, behaviour that you need to regards offending. And that's the way we need to deal with mobile phone use in exactly the same way. People need to become ashamed of using their mobile phone um, when using it. But as we've already covered, the biggest problem we've got is that we've got a group of people coming into driving now where you've got 100% saturation in mobile phone use and they are genuinely addicted to their phones. And so it becomes more, if you like, it's almost a medical issue. You know, it's a psychological issue. You've got to break that barrier between driving and touching that phone in the car. Um, demand reduction. Um, we've really got to concentrate on demand reduction and make it our reason for tackling mobile phone use. Um, and driving. Like I said, we've always mentioned the £40 million. Pounds. But across the board, we've got to look at ways to save money. We've got a country that's basically, you know, suffering at the moment, cost of living crisis. There's a shortage of money. And the way to secure investment and interest in this is, unfortunately, is to look at the sort of economic value of reducing offending rather than actually looking at the lives involved. Um, I've worked on the motorway for the last four years after moving from traffic onto the motorway and if you ever want to see an economic concentration on why offending is bad is the, the fuss that's caused if you like and the concern that's caused when the strategic network stops and the cost of the environment and so if you want to engage politicians 
and get the resources, whether that's resources for enforcement, but more importantly, resources for awareness and demand uh, reduction through behaviour change. We need to start looking at demand reduction rather than counting K KSIs um, if you want to engage the right people and get more attention from central government and for them to drive it forward rather than ourselves. But, in conclusion, unless we bring in fundamental improvements to the way that we change wholesale behaviour, then we will simply remain ineffective until technology rescues us from our own failings. And that's the way it is at the moment. Unless we take radical steps to change that we, the way we address behaviour change around the subject, we will not really improve anything until technology takes away the driving element, or the driver, I should say, away from the driving equation. And that's me done. Um, that is a little, um, those who don't know, um, I am sort of in a transition period at the moment, um, and I am shortly to retire from the police. And people keep saying, what are you going to do? And one of the things that we're doing, along with my working group, is that we're going to launch an independent policing and transport think tank, which is called the MPH Collective. Um, there's a little um, Twitter tag there. Um, it's not up and running yet. It won't be until I actually retire. But um, if you follow that account, which is sitting there, hidden at the moment, um, that will be where it all starts. Thank you.